Good evening. My name is Julie Skosky James, and I'm Vice President of the Filson Historical Society. We are so delighted that you could join us this evening for the Gertrude Pope Brown Lecture Series. This lecture series was initiated in 1993 as a memorial to the life of Gertrude Pope Brown and made possible by the continuous generous support of her daughter, Dace Brown Stubbs, and grandson, G. Garvin Brown IV. The series has brought internationally recognized historians to Louisville. More than 35,000 citizens have learned more about the significant stories of our region, nation, and the world because of the Gertrude Polk Brown lectures. The Filson is so grateful for this generosity. Tonight, I am honored to introduce to you Elaine Weiss. Elaine Weiss is a journalist and author whose writing has been recognized by the Society of Professional Journalists and by her byline appeared in many national publications, as well as in reports from the National Public Radio. Elaine's book about the women's suffrage movement, The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote, has earned glowing reviews from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR, among others. She's also presented about the women's suffrage movement across the country. Now, it is indeed my pleasure to turn the program over to Elaine. Elaine? Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be with you, even if just virtually um, here, uh, to be with you in Louisville. I wish I could be there in person, of course. And it's wonderful to be able to celebrate with you uh, this important story of Kentucky's history and to bring this essential part of our national history about equality and voting rights, about um, protest and democracy to such a distinguished audience. Now, Kentucky plays a really special role in the fight for women's suffrage as one of the most active and supportive states in the, in the South. It's the home of several national leaders of the movement, and it's one of the few Southern states to ratify the 19th Amendment. And of course, we're celebrating the centennial anniversary of the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment this summer. But Kentucky's role was also complicated. And it, like most other states, resisted giving women the ballot for many years. I'm going to sh um, share my screen with you and be able to show you some um, very neat historical uh, images uh, of suffrage history. And here is the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. Uh, these are some very notable women in your state history. Uh, again, wearing their white marching uniform. So Kentucky's role in suffrage was also complicated. And it, like most states, resisted giving women the ballot for many years. Resisted making women full partners in democracy. How these barriers were eventually and arduously overcome is the subject of my book, The Woman's Hour. And it's the story of American women's demand for the vote, once considered radical, crazy, subversive, impossible. But it was slowly and methodically transformed into constitutional law. It was made into the law of the land. And here we're going to look at how that happened. How this story, the 19th Amendment, which was the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history, giving the vote to half of the citizens of the nation who were not included when the founding fathers constructed our government supposedly by and for the people. 
So it's really about how change is made in a democracy. And that's, of course, a very timely subject at this moment. It's also how change is made in society. The 19th Amendment was not just a legal change. It was not just a constitutional change. It wasn't just an election law change. It didn't just double the national electorate. It didn't just make women full citizens for the very first time. It marked a societal change, a cultural shift in the roles and the rights of women in society. And that change, as we know, is still ongoing. Fight for women's suffrage is really one of the defining civil rights struggles in our nation's history, and one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who gets to participate in our government? Who has a voice? When we say we, the people, do we really mean everyone? And of course, we are asking those same questions today. Now, if you read standard textbooks, you'll find only a brief and fuzzy idea of how American women won. And that um, active verb, won, is very important. We were not given the vote. We were not granted the vote. It had to be fought for long and hard. But if you listen to, if you read the accounts in our textbooks, you'll find it's usually dismissed in about a sentence or maybe a paragraph. And it's usually goes something like this. Women asked for the vote at Seneca Falls in 1848. And in 1920, they were given the vote. Well, no, it did not happen like that at all. It required three generations of fearless activists working over seven decades to finally secure the vote for American women. And the culmination of that entire crusade, what we call the women's suffrage movement, came down to a fierce six-week battle staged in Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 1920. In summer 1920, one last state was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment, giving all women in every state the right to vote in every election. 35 states had already ratified but 36 or three quarters of the states then in the union, there were 48 then, were required for full ratification. And Tennessee could be the 36th state. Kentucky had already ratified. If the Tennessee legislature approved the amendment, it would become the law of the land just in time for the crucial 1920 presidential election. If the amendment failed in Tennessee, it could be delayed indefinitely and perhaps not enacted for many years to come. The suffragists were really afraid of that. They saw the pendulum swinging. They saw uh, the mood of America becoming more isolationist, more um, conservative, more reactionary in many ways. And those of us who have watched the fortunes of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was introduced into Congress in 1923, know that a constitutional amendment can get very close to ratification and not make it over the finish line. So the suffragists were very worried that if they could not achieve ratification in Tennessee, all might be lost for the foreseeable future. The, fran the enfranchisement of half of the citizens of the United States was at stake, and it all came down to Tennessee. Now, by 1920, the suffragists had been fighting for the vote for 72 years, since the first outrageous demand for the vote was made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at that Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848. Now, women's rights were few 
in mid 19th century America. Here's a little idea of what women could not do. They could not speak in public. What I'm doing right now before you, it was considered an affront for women to speak publicly, an affront to decent society. It was often called promiscuous for women to speak, especially if men were in the audience. A woman could not bring suit in a court of law. She could not testify in a court of law, and she could not serve on a jury. A married woman had no property rights. If she, she had no um, inheritance, her wages all belonged to her husband. Legally, under the laws of coverture, she was simply a possession of her husband. And she had no custodial rights over her children. They too belonged to her husband. If she left the marriage, she left the children. Women could not attend most universities or colleges or professional schools. Education at that time, we're talking about the mid 19th century, was considered a waste of time or worse, it was dangerous. And medical wisdom of the time was that it was dangerous because if a woman was allowed to study too much, to think too deeply, to take on big questions, the, again, this is the medical uh, idea of the time, the blood flow, her blood flow, would be directed to her brain to do the, all this hard thinking, and it would not, it would starve her, her reproductive organs, which would make her uh, less likely to conceive children, and that was really her only role in society. And so this scientific canard was served as a basis for denying women higher education and also the right to vote. Those same arguments were used for a long time. Women were too emotional, were too flighty, were not um, physically able to think hard and make hard decisions. Still, many of those attending the meeting at Seneca Falls thought that asking for the vote was a terrible idea. It was too radical. It would bring them um, under uh, calls of being ridiculous. They really, uh, they were called ridiculous for this, but they really feared that they would uh, be ridiculed. But there was a young man in the audience when, when the rest of the participants asked Elizabeth Stanton to withdraw her demand that women be given the vote. There was a young man in the Wesley Chapel and he stood up. He had ridden his buggy 50 miles from his home in Rochester to attend the meeting. And he stood up and he disagreed with the last speakers who had said that she should withdraw this demand. And he said, he said, no, you must demand the vote. It will not be given to you and it will not be given to me unless we fight for it. And it was a young Frederick Douglass just 30 years old, just 10 years out of slavery. And he single-handedly persuaded the other very reluctant participants in the Seneca Falls meeting to support Elizabeth Stanton's radical idea that women should be given the franchise. Now, he called himself a woman's rights man all of his life. And he truly, truly was. He's one of the great heroes of my book. He stands up for universal suffrage. He stands up for universal freedoms. He attends almost every women's rights convention for the next 50 years. In fact, he dies on the day that he had just come back from a women's rights convention in Washington, DC. Now, he didn't just happen to wander into the Seneca Falls meeting. He'd been invited by Elizabeth Stanton. They had worked together already for years in the abolition movement. In fact, the women we know as the early pioneers of the suffrage movement, Elizabeth Stanton, Susan Anthony, Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, 
were actually abolition workers before they were suffrage organizers. The idea of women's rights, the right of, to vote just being one of them, grows out of the themes of human rights central to the abolition movement. Abolition and women's suffrage were sibling causes through the Civil War for decades. And women and abolition workers fully expected that after the war, universal suffrage would be enacted. Black men and white and black women would all get the vote. But they were sadly disappointed. They were told that the nation could not handle two big reforms at once. The woman's hour had not struck, they were told. And it was a heartbreaking split. Stanton and Anthony refused to support the 14th and 15th Amendments since women were excluded from the right to vote in those. And in anger, Stanton and Anthony expressed vile racist sentiments against Black and immigrant men not as well educated as they were, but because they were men, they were able to vote. And race would remain a divisive aspect of the quest for women's suffrage from then on, used by proponents and especially by opponents of women's right to vote. In the years following Seneca Falls, tens of thousands of dedicated suffragists traveled tens of thousands of miles to wage over 900 state, national, and local campaigns. They had to travel across the country, here we see them in horse and buggy, to do, as Susan Anthony described it, organize, educate, and agitate in tiny towns and big cities across the nation. And in the course of the movement, they progress from horse and buggy. By the end, they're campaigning in automobiles. They had to travel so extensively because they had to change hearts and minds about women's role in society before they could ever hope to change the laws. And it was really a stupendous feat of organization without any of the travel or communication tools we take for granted today. When the movement began, passenger train travel was really in its infancy. There was no, uh, well, the telegraph had only just been invented. There was no typewriter. There was no telephone. And even in 1920, when my book takes place, radio was not yet in use. And so everything is being done by foot, on horseback, by horse and buggy, by mail, by hand. And as one young woman in my publisher's office uh, came into my editor's room when, uh, after she'd read the manuscript and said, wow, I don't know how these women organize like this without Facebook, but they did. They held meetings everywhere in small towns and in big cities. They held rallies and they marched, which was not considered proper for women to do. They didn't wear pink pussy hats, but they did wear their marching uniforms, white dresses with yellow sashes. Now, it's hard to imagine how brave a woman had to be to do this. And we're gonna look at that in a moment. But here are some great photographs of women marching, 40,000 women marching in New York in this picture. And when we see women wearing white, when we see congressional women wearing white at the State of the Union, that's in honor of the suffragists. When we see Geraldine Ferraro ex accept the vice presidential nomination, Hillary Clinton accept the presidential nomination wearing white, that is in honor of their suffrage foremothers. Here's again, women wearing white and marching through the streets 
Again, it's hard to imagine how difficult, how brave a woman had to be to stand up publicly for women's equality. They had to endure contempt and ridicule in their communities, in their churches, in the press. They were pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. In fact, Elizabeth, uh, Susan Anthony used to say that she could mark the progress of the movement by the projectiles that were thrown at her. And when they were no longer rotten eggs, but just plain old eggs, well, that was progress. They were attacked by mobs of angry boys and men. They were denounced as radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, even Bolsheviks. Here we're going to see some very strong images that the anti-suffrage campaigners used against the idea of women's advocacy for the What I would do is um, and say no right to have political voice. Here's another one, peace at last. Women were, the suffrage were denounced as unattractive, unsexed men, and they were going to ruin the American home. Here again, an anti-suffrage broadside showing the home or the street corner for woman. You have a choice, Mr. America. You, do you want your wife at home tending the baby, or do you want her to be a zealot on the street advocating for women's rights. Again, they're derided as unattractive. Why would any attractive woman care about the vote? She should have a man who will vote for her. And the men who supported the suffrage cause, and there were many, were often belittled as Mabels and Nancys. Again, which of these do you think was supposedly the suffragist? And here again, suffrage was going to bring about the downfall of the American home. Women were going to just abandon their families to either work for the vote or to, if they achieved the vote, to go out and be involved in politics. So here you see a typical anti-suffrage cartoon and mom is sailing out the door on election day and dad is going to be left with the screaming babies. Here's another one. When women can vote, mom is smoking a cigar and reading the sporting news while dad is again holding the screaming babies and having to knit his own trousers from her discarded old skirts. So this is a warning what family life will be like if women vote and have ideas of their own. Again, suffrage was frightening to a large segment of the population. It was going to emasculate American men and um, defeminize American women. One of my favorite suffrage cartoons, Bed of Trouble. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. In the quest for equal citizenship, the women of the suffrage movement employed a wide variety of stratagems and methods. And many of these, marches, demonstrations, picketing, acts of civil disobedience surrounding the White House, but also sophisticated lobbying and public relations operations and using legal test cases to the Supreme Court would all be adopted by the civil rights campaign of the 20th and even the 21st century. The suffragists pioneered many of these political tools. The suffragists were, were ingenious and fearless. They had to be. To test the prohibitions against women voting, Susan Anthony 
Sojourner Truth, and about 150 other women actually voted in the 1872 presidential election. I have been and gone and done it, Susan gleefully wrote to her comrade, Elizabeth Stanton. Susan Anthony was soon arrested, put on trial, and convicted of illegal voting in a federal election. Here is a contemporary magazine illustration showing Miss Anthony usurping Uncle Sam's hat, uh, standing there defiantly with her threatening umbrella. She's often depicted with her threatening umbrella. She was again arrested, put on trial, convicted, and, 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 and She brought her case to the American people, giving a series of lectures around the country, saying, is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? And of course, we're asking that question again today. The failure of this voting experiment, when it failed and women were not able to vote, led Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton to draft a constitutional amendment that would supersede all state laws which prohibited women from voting. States are in charge of voting requirements and voting procedures. And so this amendment, this constitutional law, was introduced into Congress in 1878, and it was stalled there for 40 years years. Every year the suffragists would go up to Capitol Hill and testify before Congress. It would be thrown back into the recesses of some filing cabinet and forgotten till the next year. The amendment was voted down in committee or on the floor of the House and Senate 28 times. Meanwhile, suffragists work to change the voting laws in the states because the states are, uh, again, in control. This constitution gives states uh, uh, oversight over election law. And so they tried, they had a double track of, of getting the vote and one was for a federal amendment and at the same time working in the individual states. And now we're going to talk a little bit about Kentucky because Kentucky women began agitating for the vote in the mid 19th century, but they didn't really start organizing until the 1880s. The traditional social and cultural norms in the Southern states made it really difficult to gather popular support for such an outlandish idea as women voting or even holding office. And it also made the possibility of black women voting highly controversial and made the whole aspect uh, much more difficult. Nevertheless, Kentucky nurtured many extraordinary, even visionary suffrage leaders who advocated for women's right to vote about this, on both the state and the national level. Susan Anthony was invited to Kentucky in 1879 to speak about the need for women to protect themselves with the vote. Louisville played host to a national suffrage convention in 1881. And inspired by the energy of that conference, Kentucky women formed the first statewide suffrage organization in the entire South, the Kentucky Woman Suffrage Association. The core leadership of the association was provided by four sisters the Clay Sisters of Lexington. The president of the Kentucky Association was the youngest sister, Laura Clay. Laura and her sisters, and here we see a picture of her, grew up in a politically active family, daughters of the Kentucky anti-slavery leader, Cassius Clay, who freed the slaves he'd inherited from his father and published an influential abolitionist newspaper. Clay was a friend and supporter of Abraham Lincoln, who dispatched him as a minister to Russia 
during the Civil War. His wife and the Clay daughters ran the family farm while he was away. Cassius stayed in Russia long after the war was over. The women kept the farm going. While unbeknownst to them, he started a new family over there, fathering several children. He returned to Kentucky in 1869, bringing a few of his new offspring with him. And as you can imagine, this sparked quite a scandal. He divorced his wife, even though she had brought much of the property and wealth into the marriage and had run the business on her own for years. But under Kentucky law, she had no right to this property or the house or any possessions. She and her daughters were plunged into poverty. And the daughters, all well-educated women, were furious at this injustice. They decided to devote themselves to changing the laws which discriminated against women. And the best way to secure these rights was to obtain the right to vote. So Laura wrote that her upbringing in an anti-slavery household had taught her and her sisters to, quote, hate oppression and injustice. And our own unhappy domestic life has left my eyes unblinded to the unjust relations between men and women and the unworthy position of women. Laura was only 32 years old when she assumed the presidency of the Kentucky Women's Suffrage Association and remained president of that organization for the next 30 years, restructuring the group in 1888 into the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. So it changed its name. Now, unlike many other suffrage groups concentrated only which concentrated only on suffrage. The uh, Laura Clay led the Kentucky Equal Rights Group into a broad menu of women's rights causes. And she had remarkable success convincing the legislature to, to change several pivotal laws that barred, for instance, married women from owning property and controlling their own income or making wills. She had them changed by a lobbying in the legislature. The organization also pushed for coeducation in Kentucky colleges. Now, it must be remembered that these equal rights were intended only for white women. Laura was the great gardener of the Southern women's suffrage movement planting suffrage clubs throughout the southern states. She was always traveling and um, inspiring new groups to form. She was a popular speaker and a fantastic organizer. Laura entered the national suffrage movement, becoming a protege of Susan B. Anthony. She became one of her nieces, one of the uh, young women Anthony was grooming for leadership of the movement when she was gone. Laura served on the National American Women's Suffrage Association's executive board. She was the voice of the South at the highest reaches, reaches of the movement. And she was sent off on suffrage campaigns across the country. She was also a very effective lobbyist in Congress and in state houses around the country. Laura and her sisters were joined by several generations of talented Kentucky suffrage organizers. Women like Madeline McDowell Breckenridge, a progressive reformer who astutely led the Kentucky Equal Rights Association from 1912 to 1920, and also led them in this suffrage parade in May of 1916. Suffrage Parade is biggest ever held in Kentucky. And here's a close up of women marching in Lexington. Another distinguished suffrage organizer in Kentucky, Nanny Helen Burroughs, an educator and reformer who organized African American suffragists in Louisville. Also, Mary Ellen Britton, a popular speaker on the Kentucky suffrage circuit. 
There is also Josephine Henry, Eugenia Farmer, and many more. But as much as Laura Clay devoted her life to gaining the franchise for women, she wanted it achieved her own way. She was a fervent believer in states' rights, and she did not want the federal government in the form of a constitutional amendment to give Kentucky women the vote. She wanted the legislature in Lexington to give it to them. So she opposed the 19th Amendment on states' rights grounds. She also did not want Black women to be able to vote, and the 19th Amendment does give the vote to all women. And this put her on a collision course, not only with the national movement, but with her own Kentucky suffrage colleagues who did support the 19th Amendment. But in fact, the amendment was still safely stalled in Congress until 1918. And that was just fine with Laura Clay. But a new generation, a third generation, was had emerged. And by this time, they had grown impatient. This third generation was no longer willing to wait, no longer willing to ask politely, there's another picture of Laura, no longer willing to ask politely for the vote. They were willing to be aggressive, to be rude, to be disruptive, to even break the law. A young woman, Quaker woman from New Jersey named Alice Paul, who had trained with the more radical wing of the suffrage movement in Great Britain, left mainstream suffrage to practice what she called direct action techniques. And her National Women's Party did things that had never been done before. They picketed the White House. They protested on the steps of the Capitol, and they even burned President Woodrow Wilson in effigy. Hundreds of Women's Party suffragists were arrested and served time in prison for their civil disobedience. The suffrage prisoners were held in decrepit, vermin-infested cells. They were physically assaulted, clubbed, tied to the law, to the wall, not allowed to read or write or even to speak one another. They communicated by singing. When they refused to eat, they considered themselves political prisoners, not common prisoners and not common criminals. They were force fed, tubes rammed down their noses. When they were released, they toured the country in copies of their prison uniforms on something called the prison special, which they rented a Pullman car. It took a northern route through major cities and a southern route coming back, stopping in every town and every city to hold a march, a rally, a speech. And they said, we are your mothers, your sisters, your wives, your grandmothers even, and we have been arrested and tortured in prison for demanding our rights as citizens. And this began to make a strong impression on the American public, made it harder for Congress to stall even longer on the amendment. Remember, it's been there for 40 years. So finally, in June of 1919, after World War I was over, after the federal amendment had been stranded there for four decades. It was finally passed by both houses of Congress and sent to the states for ratification. A year later, in the summer of 1920, the amendment was on the cusp of victory or possibly defeat as it arrived in Tennessee. Because Tennessee was a dangerous place to stage this definitive battle for women's equality. Nearly all the other southern states had already rejected the amendment except Kentucky and uh, again Tennessee, uh, pardon me, uh, I think it's Arkansas, 
And they had used the same rationale. They did not want black women to be able to vote. Suffragists faced an uphill battle in Tennessee, but they knew they had no choice. Tennessee was their last best hope. So all the forces for and against women's suffrage gather in Nashville and it gets wild. The suffrage generals, the, the campaign generals arrive. And again, here is the governor of Kentucky signing the ratification with Kentucky suffragists surrounding him, making sure he dots every I and crosses every T. And this is a great moment of triumph for them as he ratifies. Um, I have to say that Laura Clay was not happy about this. A year later, again, uh, after that ratification, it all comes down to Tennessee and Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the national, the mainstream national American Women's Suffrage Association, comes down from headquarters in New York. She's called the chief. She's the protege of Susan Anthony. She had worked very closely with Laura Clay and all the preceding decades of suffrage work. And she comes down to be the, the manager, the strategist for getting the vote, uh, the, the amendment through the Tennessee legislature. Also arriving at Union Station, Nashville, on the same night, in fact, young Sue Shelton White, who was returning home to Tennessee to lead the ratification campaign for the National Women's Party. Again, you had two women's organizations working towards the same goal, but they had separate leadership, separate staff, separate headquarters in the same hotel. But they, again, they're both working for ratification. Also arriving that night in summer of 1920, Josephine Pearson, leader of the Tennessee anti-suffragists who had promised her dying mother that she would fight the scourge of women's suffrage if it ever reached her home state. And she arrived to, in Nashville to protect it from what she called the feminist peril. They were joined by more than a thousand men and women, including Laura Clay, who came to Nashville to work on the side of the anti-suffragists, working against ratification in Tennessee. She was uncomfortable joining forces with the anti-suffragists who'd been her nemesis for all these years, working against her own suffrage colleagues, but she does come and does that. And Carrie Catt painfully notes that her former colleagues' presence in Nashville is disturbing. Laura Clay is here, she wrote to a friend, appealing to Negrophobia and every other caveman's prejudice. When Clay and her former suffrage sisters passed one another in the state house or in the hotel, they pretended they did not see one another. It's a really sad, heartbreaking story. Here's a, a picture and a, a, a drawing of Laura Clay addressing an audience. There were powerful forces, along with Laura Clay, working against ratification in Tennessee. Political, corporate, and ideological foes, each with their own reasons for opposing the amendment. Politicians who feared this unpredictable new voting bloc. 27 million women would be eligible to vote in the 1920 election, and no one knew how they would vote. Clergymen. Some supported women's suffrage, many did not, fearing that women's voting went against what they considered the will of God. Uh, it went against God's plan for women to be submissive to men. And they found this objectionable and used biblical teaching to, uh, from the pulpit to oppose women's suffrage. 
there were also corporations who were working against women's suffrage. And we don't often think of corporations being involved in the suffrage movement, but they very much were. Uh, again, they saw it as a threat to their bottom lines. For instance, the textile manufacturers opposed women going to the polls because they feared that women, mothers, might want to um, support legislation that would abolish child labor. And they, their industry depended upon child labor. It was cheap. It also depended upon cheap women's labor. And they didn't want anything to mess that up. So they worked strenuously against women's emancipation. Uh, enfranchisement. The liquor industry was also greatly involved, even though prohibition was, in fact, in effect in the summer of 1920. What the liquor industry was hoping was that women who had always been associated strongly with the temperance movement would, they were hoping that if they keep women away from the ballot box in 1920, that perhaps prohibition laws, which had already been passed, 18th Amendment had been ratified, that the, the laws would not be enforced too stringently. So they're hoping to keep women away, and they are very active in Nashville that summer. Uh, in fact, they sponsor a speakeasy on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel, where everyone is staying, the legislature, legislators, the suffragists, the anti-suffragists. And this is a 24-7 dispensary of liquor uh, to the legislators who then had to listen to the reasons why they should oppose ratification. It came to be known as the Jack Daniels Suite for Tennessee's favorite liquor. And the, there are great scenes uh, that, I, that I report in the book of the legislators bouncing off the walls, singing at the top of their lungs, and they have to be thrown into the showers and to sober up before they can go into the chamber to vote. But the most passionate foes of the 19th Amendment turned out to be women. That women might oppose their own enfranchisement was shocking to me. Uh, but we have to understand that many of these antis, as they were called, were social and religious conservatives who feared that suffrage would bring about a profound and troubling shift in gender roles. It would endanger the American home, and we saw some of those broadsides uh, depicting that. It would bring about what they called the moral collapse of the nation. It would alter private life as well as public life. And this is what was so frightening. Here's one of my favorite anti-suffrage broadsides on that topic. It's called America When Feminized. And it shows a rooster and a hen. And the hen is wearing her Votes for Women sash. And she has just walked off the nest. And the rooster calls after her, Ma, the eggs are going to get cold. And she calls back, sit on them yourself, old man my country calls me. And one of the taglines under the, the cartoon says, a vote for the federal suffrage amendment is a vote for organized female nagging forever. So there. But I think this is also, all kidding aside, an important reminder that the debate over women's suffrage was never just a political debate. It was also a social and cultural and for some a moral debate about the roles and the rights of women in society. And so in that way it was a precursor to what we call the culture wars today. And that's what made it so passionate and so difficult. So all sides confront one another in Nashville and it gets wild. There's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail. There's conspiracies and kidnappings and fistfights. The newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon. The outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment. 
and I won't spoil it for you, but it does come down to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature who receives a letter from his mother. Now, all this took place exactly a century ago. We're celebrating the centennial this summer. But I think you'll find that this history has some surprising and even unnerving modern themes. It helps explain where we've been, but also where we are right now. It deals with topics that dominate our headlines today. Voting rights and voter suppression, women's rights, inequality, protest, dark money in politics, the role of religion in formulating public policy, and racism. Because the history of suffrage in America is inevitably a story about race. In Nashville, there are cries of white supremacy and states' rights. The Ku Klux Klan is invoked as a dog whistle. And the Confederate flag is waved in defiance. And here's a picture of the opening ceremonies of the anti-ratification headquarters in the Hermitage Hotel. And as you can see, the flag is being waved and there's all kinds of symbols of uh, the Klan in this photograph. Now, I wrote this book before the 2016 presidential election. But this story of the suffragists' long fight for democracy and the final battle in Nashville has taken on layers of meaning I could not have anticipated. This history of citizens fighting for their rights, protesting, being arrested, enters a new dimension as rights we have assumed to be secure, voting rights, citizenship rights, First Amendment rights, women's rights, appear to be endangered once again. And this history of women political activists and leaders resonates as an historic number of women run for office at every level. And more women are serving in Congress now, 131 in the current Congress, than ever before. Now, there are important lessons to be learned from the fight for women's suffrage, that social change is slow and political change is hard, that the struggle to expand our democracy is ongoing. It was not won in 1920. It is not complete today. While the 19th Amendment gave the vote to all women, Black women and Black men, as well as Asian women and Native American women would have to wait decades longer to secure their voting rights. In the South, as we well know, racist Jim Crow laws prevented Black women from exercising their 19th Amendment rights. This story also shows us that reform movements are imperfect. The story of women's suffrage is both an inspiring and also a cautionary tale. It's complicated. It's messy. There were moral compromises made to achieve success that should make us wince. I hope the story I tell will teach a new generation of activists that protest is patriotic and it is necessary, but it must be followed up by well-designed and sustained political strategies. The suffragists did not just march and picket. They debated and lobbied and drafted legislation and campaigned. And they did not rest once the 19th Amendment entered the Constitution. Carrie Chapman Catt founded the League of Women Voters, which is celebrating its centennial year right now also. And Alice Paul, drafted the Equal Rights Amendment, intended to be the next step for women's equality. It was introduced into Congress in 1923. And as we know, it has still not been enacted. The vote is a prayer 
as Carrie Catt described it, the vote is power. And today, our responsibility is to protect the vote for all citizens. We cannot and we should not accept attempts to restrict or suppress voting. Voting rights is not a partisan issue. It is the stress test of the health of our democracy. And I fear too often we are failing that test. <clears throat> when Carrie Cat returned home to Westchester after leaving Nashville, she wrote a letter to the American people. And she wrote a benediction and a charge. And I find it as meaningful and powerful today as the day it was written. And I'd like to close by reading part of it to you. The vote is the emblem of your equality, women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul, which you can never comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Understand what it means and what it can do for your country. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. The vote is won. 72 years the battle for this privilege has been waged, but human affairs with their eternal change move on without pause. Progress is calling to you to make no pause, act. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elaine. We'll ask you to go ahead and un un share your screen. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have time for a couple of uh, quick questions from the audience. So first comes a question from um, Stephen. And his question is, um, were there states or areas where women could vote before the amendment passed? Yes, that's an excellent question. It's always a little hard to kind of wrap your head about around this. But again, as I explained, um, suffrage can be conferred by the states or uh, by the federal government. And yes, there, uh, by 1920, there were actually almost 15 states where women could vote. Begins in the Western states, Wyoming, as we know, is the first state to allow women to vote. And then the other Western states, uh, which begin as territories. So Wyoming is a territory in 1869 when it allows women to vote. And when it wants to enter the union, um, Congress says, well, you allow your women to vote. We don't do that in the United States. And the governor writes this beautiful letter where he says, we would stay out of the union a hundred years if we could not bring our women with us. And so they are, um, uh, they, they do bring uh, their women. And in 1890, they become the first state to allow women to vote. Uh, they're followed by um, uh, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, the Western states. Again, part of it is the pioneer spirit. Part of it is they needed women. There were, you know, like six women in Wyoming at that time. And so they are actively um, inviting women to come to those states, come, come live with us and you can vote. So yes, uh, California, um, uh, by referendum, um, the male inhabitants, the male citizens allow the vote. Uh, New York, women get the vote in 1917. So there is some movement, uh, but it was clear that many would not be able to vote if, okay. unless there was a federal amendment. Uh, this next question is from Kyle. He would like to know, what were the best resources that you came across in your research? And was the movement documented in the press mostly in anti-suffrage tone or did any major publications support the movement both in Kentucky or nationally? I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing that. Could you repeat it? Sure. Um, what were the best resources that you came across in your research? And was the movement documented in the press mostly in anti-suffrage tone or did any major publications 
support the movement, both in Kentucky or nationally? No, oh, that's a wonderful, uh, complicated question. Um, yes, there, there are wonderful resources. Uh, the Library of Congress has the papers of most of the suffrage, uh, the national organizations. I'm sure that the Kentucky Historical Society uh, and the, the State Library have many of Laura Clay's uh, papers and the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. Um, I did, as a, as a journalist, I was especially interested in how newspapers covered the, the movement. In the beginning, well, actually until the very end, you see many newspapers cover it on the women's pages with fashion, with the announcement of tea parties, with um, the social news. So they don't see it as political uh, for a long time. There were, in every city, there was usually an anti-suffrage newspaper and a pro-suffrage newspaper, at least their editorial boards were. And that, that certainly was true in New York. It was true in uh, Nashville. I imagine it was true in, in the major cities of Kentucky. And it's very interesting to see their different spins on the, uh, the progress of the movement. Okay, and we have time for one final quick question. Uh, they want to know, did Miss, Miss Clay never married? Question mark. My understanding is she never married. Um, and I'm not sure any of the four sisters did, but I'm not, I, I, I'd have to do a little more research. Uh, they were very scarred by what their father did. But she was also, at that time, many of the leaders uh, were not married so that they could pursue their their work in the movement. Well, Elaine, I'm sure everyone joins me in thanking you so much for the wonderful presentation, and we hope to have you back in Kentucky sometime. Thank you, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I hope to be able to come. Thank you. Thank you.